Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Global Migrant Festival. Uh, it's my pleasure today to have with us uh, Joanna Bowers, and we're going to talk about this film that she made, which is called The Helper Documentary. The Helper Documentary chronicles diverse stories from Hong Kong's migrant domestic workers exploring their immense contribution to, to society in the face of heartbreaking separation from their loved ones. The documentary takes a look at the invisible sector of care work that keeps the financial sector of Hong Kong alive. And I had the pleasure of wa watching this documentary just this weekend. Um, and I understand that the festival has a couple of clips um, off the documentary uh, that we will be screening and sharing with you guys tonight. My name is Lisa Avellino. I'm Mabel. I'm Tess. My daughter is Sino. Narcisa Taneo. Connie Felica. Filma Hundarino. Mujiastri. Bridgie. Yumi. Cecilia. I am, I am. I'm a domestic helper. Domestic helper. Domestic helper. Domestic helper. Domestic helper in Hong Kong. Oh, hi, Hong Kong. Cho Kung Yang. The term domestic uh, helper is misleading, I feel, uh, simply because helper means many different things in many different contexts. To some domestic helpers, helper describes to them what they do. They help people get on with their daily life. To many others, helper has a connotation of subservience and servitude. A helper to me is first and foremost an employee, okay? An employee that I'm very fond of, but an employee who has the same rights that any other employee would have. Hired household help is actually a global phenomenon. And hired household help differs depending on your income, on your nationality, on your place of living. Say for instance you're in America, you have a babysitter. And if you're in Europe, you may have a student au pair. Um, in Africa, we have many aunties. So when I arrived to Hong Kong, it was the first time I was confronted with the concept of a foreign domestic helper who was a live-in and from a neighboring country, but not necessarily part of the family. In those days in Hong Kong, we did not have foreign domestic helpers. So my mom did that, and it was a live-in armor. I'm from Indonesia, the Philippines. I've been working in Hong Kong for 22 years. I've been here for seven years. 18 years. Four years. 20 years. 25 years. 26 years. 25 years? 30, almost 37 years. Because that was March 1979 when I started with them. Hong Kong to earn money for my kids because I am a single mom and I have to raise them by my own. I consider myself a breadwinner in my family. I come here to work and earn for my family. Earn more money for my family. Earn money and to support my family and their needs. Because uh, I'm just a high school graduate there so it's hard to find work in the Philippines. Because uh, I don't have any work in the Philippines. Because in the Philippines, I have no job. Job in the Philippines is quite difficult to find. In Hong Kong, it's more uh, salary than in our country. Financially, you could have a stable income. It's quite hard, but since I'm here, it's better life now. Because if I'm staying in the Philippines, I cannot do that. Because we don't want them to suffer in the Philippines.
I came from the Philippines. I was born in Negros. And then when I was five years old, my family moved to the south. And I grew up in Davao City. It's not easy because my parents are poor, so we don't have a permanent job. But well, there's nothing much you can do about it. You just have to survive. I only managed to reach high school. I just couldn't afford to go to college. I always have this dream that someday I'll go somewhere and make life better. But in, in some sense, what, what, what are you going to do if you stay in one place? There's nothing there for you, so you have to move somewhere. Coming to Hong Kong, it's like three times the payment, so everyone wants to go. So it's my opportunity to come over. I arrived the first day, it's like everything's new. Never been into this very nice city. Uh, everything's just, I see the, I saw the MTR train. And at first, it's the airplane. <laughs> Never been, this is my first time to go on an airplane. Oh, it's amazing. It's a little bit scary being away from family, away from home, speak a, a foreign language. You know, you have to deal with, with strangers, work with a family that's foreign to you, like Westerners. So you don't really know. It's different culture, totally. Would you like to come and help me put some scones put in the oven? But you be careful, it's hot, okay? Do you want to help as well? Do you want to see? Come to have a look. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, dear. Come on, shake it, shake, shake, shake. Come on, shake it. There you go. Is it good? Okay. I say I'm used to doing the housework, but it's a different the way we do it back home. And it's different from the, the way the Westerners do it. So you have to really do your best follow all the instructions. It's not an easy one the first time because uh, I'm not used to all the gadgets like all the dishwashers, all this uh, washing machine. <laughs> we don't have to do the manual washing machine and, and then the oven. Everything's new, so new experience. Oh, and then I get used to it. So it's nice by the time I get to earn my first salary. Then, oh yes, money, <laughs> more than I can, you know. I can imagine I, I earn for a whole year. It's just really overwhelming for the first timer. And uh, I get excited and I get so motivated to do more. I want to stay in Hong Kong. Well, she's part of the kids' lives. Um, she's been with us since more or less, well, from the first months that we arrived in Hong Kong. I think she, she's obviously very important. Um, you know, when she comes uh, out in the morning, it's hugs and kisses all around. And, at bedtime, it's hugs and kisses all round. Sit down. Which one shall we read first? Um, that. What's that? Um, that. Little book of baby animals. What's that? Baby. That is a pig. <laughs> it's a pig. It's very nice. How about that? Our baby's very, baby's very first bedtime book. Duhan ang pagpapagod at paghihirap ng aming naway na maging kabusugan at kalakasan ng aming mga katawan. Amen. Mm -hmm. My name is Annelin from the Philippines and I live in Manila. I came to Hong Kong because, you know, I would like to give the best future to my children. In Manila is, uh, I can work there, yeah, but the problem is salary is very low compared to here. And uh, I think it is better to be, you know, it's, even it's really hard for them to be far with them, but I have to sacrifice. My eldest son, he finished already his education, four years course, hotel and restaurant management. And by next year, early, early next year, my youngest son will finish engineer. And I can say that I am a best and very proud mom with that, you know, because Maybe if I didn't come to Hong Kong, I think I couldn't give them the best future and I couldn't send them into the best school. My eldest son, up to now, he couldn't understand why I'm far with them. Because up to now, he's still blaming me. 
Why? Because he has so many questions. Why there are some families that they can still survive, even they are not far with their children, but I am trying my best to understand him because I would like to give you the best future. But my youngest son is very quiet and he's just trying to tell me that it's okay, Mama, I understand, but don't worry, everything will be fine. So I hope someday. Going back to Hong Kong now, it's hard to say goodbye. To be honest, it's really hard. But as I've said, I, I have no choice, you know. I still need to work. I would like to spend the Christmas with them, with my family, you know, my kids. Because it's been more than 10 years, I think, I don't spend the Christmas with them, yeah. So hopefully. If we didn't have Annalyn, then I wouldn't be able to go to work feeling as confident and relaxed as I do. I probably wouldn't work if we didn't have her. Having Annalyn means that, that me and my husband can work full time and know that our children are safe, being well looked after, loved, cared for while we're at work so we don't have to worry about that. It takes away the anxiety. I'm taking care of the kids, which is not my own children, but I treated them like my own and I think they saw that one. They trusted me so much. Going back to work for me was hard and having to make the sacrifice of going to work and not being able to care for my children myself. Um, so I can't even imagine how hard it must be to have to make the choice to leave the country where you live, where your family and your own children are, to have to go to make a living. It's a choice she had to make so that she could give her, her boys a future, but yeah, I don't think it can compare, really. Um, it's my pleasure to be able to have a conversation with Joanna, the director and filmmaker um, of the Helper documentary. Uh, and she uh, is uh, in Hong Kong right now. And mm -hmm. I'm here in Singapore. And I was just struck by um, the similarity um, in terms of the migrant domestic worker population in both our countries. Uh, the statistics are actually really similar. Um, and, and I found out that as of September 2020, there are approximately 370,000 foreign domestic helpers working in Hong Kong. And the majority of the foreign domestic helpers come from the Philippines and Indonesia, uh, which is really similar to what uh, the situation that we have in Singapore, uh, where we have a very advanced um, global economy, uh, in some senses, really um, built on the backs of invisible care work uh, from the migrant domestic worker population. And uh, what I found is that uh, you know, through the Helper documentary, Joanna gives us um, an insight into the lives of these women. They are no longer just statistics. Uh, they really are, uh, they become, uh, you, you see them in their full agency. You see them uh, in their moments of triumph, um, as well as moments uh, of despair and sadness. And I think it was just such a, a beautiful portrait of the full humanity uh, in these women who, uh, who actually are so much part of our everyday lives. So introducing Joanna, um, Joanna made her directorial debut in 2009 after graduating from the University of Leeds with a bachelor's in broadcast journalism with the BBC. Uh, from writing and directing cabaret performances in Dubai to creating content for networks, including MTV and LA, she began her directing career unwittingly when asked to direct the short film In Violet Rose. This was quickly followed by other directing work, including the TV pilot Riding Hood's All Rhyme, No Reason, and a range of other commercial fashion and narrative projects. She now lives in Hong Kong, working as a writer and director, 
creating original content filming throughout Asia. Recent shoots for brands include Cathay Pacific, HSBC, and The North Face. Um, and her most re recent venture is the Helper documentary. I'm not sure whether this is an up-to-date bio, so... It's not sure anymore, you but... <laughs> You can fill us in later on what you've been up to since yeah. then. Well. Um, but I thought I'll just start off with uh, a really simple question. What inspired you to make the documentary The Helper? Um, and I understand that you too are a migrant um, in uh, Hong Kong. So what were your own initial observations of the lives of um, foreign domestic workers in Hong Kong? And perhaps like the disparity between yours or, or your experience of Hong Kong um, and, and the women that you feature in The Helper? Yeah, I mean, I think I had a really um, common experience for new arrivals into Hong Kong when, you know, your first weekend out and you're either looking for an apartment or what have you, and you're, you're in Central District or any, any of those sort of urban areas on Hong Kong Island, and suddenly you're like, who are all these women? Like, what are they doing? And, you know, first common questions are like, are they protesting something? Or are they, you know, they don't look homeless. They're not acting like they're homeless. And, you know, for anyone coming from anywhere else in the world, you're like, wow, what, like, why can these, why are these, why is this population not integrated into the rest, into society on a Sunday, like, like the rest of uh, Hong Kongers? And then once you learn about their lives and that they're migrant domestic workers and that most of them, I mean, the places that you see them sitting out on a Sunday, like that's their living room, mm. right? Like that's that's the equivalent of their temporary living room because they don't have that, that private space of their own often. Um, you know, the rule in Hong Kong is all the migrant domestic workers must live with their employers and Hong Kong apartments are frequently, you know, really, really small and cramped. Um, especially migrant domestic workers, helper rooms. So, you know, they want to get out for the day on a Sunday, they want to escape and catch up with their friends, but they can't afford like the rest of us, you know, Hong Kong's a really expensive place to live. So they can't afford cinema tickets or eating out in restaurants or however, you know, the, a lot of other people might socialize in Hong Kong. Um, and so for these women, um, these sort of sitting out areas and, and, and park, sort of various parks and places like that become their living rooms for the day. So yeah, for me, um, you know, it was one of those things where at first I was just kind of stunned by the disparity um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and, and I found it really upsetting at first. Um, and then I realized once I once I got to know some migrant workers in migrant domestic workers in Hong Kong, I you know I realized okay, well I, I get why they're here. Um, I understand that you know they're here to make a better lives for their families back home. They don't have the same opportunity back home to um, earn the same levels of income that they might uh, working as a domestic worker here in Hong Kong. Um, you know, so actually, you know, from their perspective, a lot of the time it, it really is a better situation. Um, but it still doesn't seem particularly fair that that's how they have to spend their Sundays. Um, although, you know, as as we portrayed in the film, it's not like everyone does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I also noticed from your bio that you um, spend some time living in Dubai, which is also another economy uh, which relies quite heavily on domestic workers from the Philippines. Uh, yeah. I was wondering whether you, know, you had any experiences with the domestic worker population in Dubai or was your first interaction really in Hong Kong? No, I actually, working in Dubai was actually the first time I met migrant workers, but I wouldn't say that they were, they weren't migrant domestic workers, they were working in the hotel um, that I worked in. I was, you know, a fresh graduate when I was there, and I remember having this conversation with two of my staff members in the hotel. One had come from Morocco, and one had come from the Philippines, and I was chatting, you know, they were young women and a little bit older than me, and one of them said, yeah, 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 you know, I've, I've got a four-year-old back home, and I was like, wait, what? Like, in Morocco? when are you going to see them again? You know, like it, it just completely blew my mind that first experience. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, you know, I'm away for four years. I'll get to go home. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, in the amount that you're missing out. And you know, this was, this was sort of 20 years ago. So it's not like we didn't have the video phones and the FaceTime and the Skype and the WhatsApp and everything um, that we have nowadays, which doesn't, doesn't make that situation okay, but it makes it better. Um, and so, yeah, that was my, that was sort of my first experience. Um, and then realizing that, you know, lots of these migrant workers, uh, 
even if, within the hotels, let alone top construction was the other big place that I would see it in the Middle East. Um, you know, they're they're certainly not living in the same conditions that um, that, that myself as a migrant, but potentially a more expat considered <laughs> migrant. Um, you know, the opportunity that, that and the circumstances that I was having. So yeah, it was, that was, you know, coming from the UK, um, that was one of the first sort of real eye-opening moments for me um sort of with experiencing living internationally and 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 seeing what life can be like for migrant workers so how did you move from you know making those observations as you you saw how the women spend their their days off um sitting in public spaces to actually making a full-on documentary where you know you you went really in depth uh, into the lives of these women like what was the journey like uh, it was a long journey. Um, you know, from the first weekend in Hong Kong, I was like, oh my gosh, I've always been drawn as a filmmaker to telling women's stories. Mm -hmm. And I really knew watching watching these women, I was like, my gosh, I bet they've got some stories to tell. Um, but initially, obviously, I was new in Hong Kong and I didn't really have any of the resources or the capacity to do it. So it was just an idea that was on the back burner for me for a few years. Um, then eventually I was introduced to Tony Verb, who was my producing partner on the Helper documentary. And he was a part of an organization here called the uh, World Up Economic Forum's Global Shapers Community. And their focus uh, in Hong Kong that year for the community was working on helping migrant domestic workers. So because of that, um, he had been introduced to this uh, sort of recent organization set up in Hong Kong called the Domestic Workers Roundtable, which was an initiative set up by um, some law professors from HKU in collaboration with Emily Lau, who was the head of the Democratic Party here. And it really brought basically all the stakeholders, you know, um, the NGOs, the workers unions, the employers unions, everyone kind of involved in the space in civil society, brought them all into one room and they were discussing what the problems were and what the solutions were. And so Tony and I, I had connected about you know he was also interested in making something about the domestic workers we connected and we were invited into the space and suddenly you know we had everybody we would ever need to talk to and all the issues and you know the most pressing circumstances sort of in front of us and then that happened sort of in tandem with um I don't know if you would have read in the uh in the news, there was a really upsetting case here in Hong Kong where an Indonesian migrant domestic worker called Erwiana, um, she was abused terribly by her employer um, to the point that she couldn't walk and then she was sent home on a plane um, mm. when she was no use anymore and the employer had been prosecuting and was sent to prison. And I think that that really stirred up in Hong Kong feelings of you know from the majority of the population of you know like no 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 these these women are so important to us everyone I think was heartbroken that this this has been allowed to happen to somebody and I think people sort of you know wanted to know more about these women's lives and certainly wanted to step up and support that and so that to me was kind of the um the touch the you know the touchstone for the for this uh, project coming together because tony and i were like wow well we've got all these connections there's definitely some public feeling um we knew that we were going to have to raise the funding for the project on kickstarter um you know we knew we wanted to do the project professionally and properly and you know with a proper film crew and a proper budget but you know we knew that no one was going to fund a feature film a feature documentary film about migrant workers so we were like okay we've got to do it off of our own backs but the the outpouring of people wanting to support that population at the time because of Oriana meant that suddenly our kickstarter had all these people that were super keen to pledge and we were and, and we succeeded with that which was how we were able to make the film Wow, that's amazing. So if you could give us a little bit of the timeline, like when was this the idea, you know, when, when you met everyone, um, as you said, at the forum, and then so when that, you met Kickstarter? So that must have, I think we must have met everybody. I guess it must have been like end of, I must have met Tony and Tony in, in like 2012, 2013, something like that. It was middle end of 2014 when the um, Migrant Domestic Workers Roundtable community thing happened in Hong Kong. Then I think it was sort of, about January that Tony and I decided that we'd have a go at making the film. We were shooting the Kickstarter trailer and putting all the, you know, gosh, we must have shot the teaser for Kickstarter about five times um, and doing a lot of our initial interviews that we wanted to include in that Kickstarter teaser. That took us up until about June and then prepping it. And then we launched the Kickstarter campaign. I think it was July 1st that ran for a month. Um, and then we had our funding and then that was it. We were off into production. So it was fully funded by Kickstarter. 
Uh, not entirely. Um, we did get some incredible donations from other people uh, beyond, and we did have one amazing investor out of the UK um, who also supported us financially. So it was the majority, the lion's share of the funding was Kickstarter. But initially going into the Kickstarter, we thought that we were getting a corporate match grant, um, which unfortunately kind of we found out at the last minute wasn't as simple as we thought it was going to be and ended up not working out. So, you know, it was a really shoestring budget. Um, yeah. Um, we made it work. Wow. So how much money did you raise on the on the Kickstarter? Uh, I think we raised something like 90, about 90,000 US. Oh, wow. But I mean, I really love how, um, you know, it's, it's really like has this grassroots kind of energy uh, behind the documentary. Uh, and it's, you know, it's so socially conscious and you are already kind of like getting that buy-in at the point of starting to make the film. Um, and I, I think it really shows in the work, um, you know, just how much like the narratives of the women are so centered. Uh, because every time I watch a documentary like this, I I always what I always look out for, you know, how much of it is it focused on the women telling their own stories. And I really saw that in your documentary. Yeah, so, so I appreciated it a lot. <laughs> that, that was always really important to me. Yeah. Um, you know, and, th and that was also that was also one of the hardest parts of making it, to be honest, was that I was like, I knew that the women had to tell their own stories. So number one, it was finding um, you know, the, the characters with the stories. Number two, that were also, you know, eloquent and, and confident enough to talk on camera and let us into their lives. And then number three, it was the trust. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think a lot of the time in the media in Hong Kong uh, and probably in Singapore, I think a lot of the media coverage of, of domestic workers isn't very positive. It's, it, it, you know, the, the, it's quite critical. Um, you know, it's it's whenever anyone's being prosecuted for, you know, anything anything negligent, you know, that seems to sort of raise a lot of heckles. And so that was another really important element about this is that, you know, we went into this film, making this film that was going to be um, a positive film, uh, you know, but also not critical, not critical of, you know, the Hong Kong population as em as employers, which, you know, was another way that it could have come as a result of the uh, Wiana case. And I was like, no, you know, no one, no one wants to go watch a film that is, um, you know, dark or critical or anything like that you know you you catch a lot more flies with honey right and so sort of from very very early on in the genesis of the project it was like this film is about women empowering women right so that the migrant domestic worker population in hong kong empower all the rest of us working women in order to be able to go back into the workforce uh, you know once we've had families or you know running a household and, and having a job and i felt like that was the angle that was so important to tell this story and to to really resonate it and, and kind of like you say get that word of mouth grassroots um support for the project yeah no i i really think that theme of empowerment really came through because i think the danger when making documentaries or works like this right is that we are kind of like portraying domestic workers as passive victims. Um, and I'm very conscious of that myself because I've done like research in this area where you know, I'm trying to help uh, women tell their stories and I don't want to like reinscribe like the same kind of stereotypes. But I think what really came across when you let the women tell their own stories is this sense of agency about you know their choice to come to Hong Kong to work, right? And that, Yes, I mean, it's a choice that comes with a great many sacrifices, but it's also one which um, you can tell like they have ownership over that choice and they do feel empowered um, by like the opportunities uh, that this economic choice uh, to migrate has opened up to them, whether that's like mountain climbing in the case of um, Lisa, or, you know, whether that's like providing uh, their, uh, their children with an education and like sending them all the way up to college. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I really saw that coming through all the stories of the women. Um, and I think you found women who have like just amazing personalities. I mean, they were such a joy to watch on screen. So I, I'm yeah. just wondering how you managed to find these women. <laughs> Oh, crikey. Um, 
yeah, so I guess um, the first stop for finding the women and finding the stories was, um, you know, when we were in the research phase for the film, um, someone shared on social, on my Facebook, I think, on, a, on a, some sort of a group, I mean, the, a video of the Unsung Heroes Choir singing their song, Kiss You Goodnight, that Jane Engelman wrote. And I saw that and I was just like, oh my God, like, yeah. you know, heartbroken. Oh this is so I and you know and there's um there have there have been other documentaries about choirs and about music and I've always found them really impactful and really dynamic and I was like oh wow okay you know this is this is also presenting the migrate uh, micro domestic workers in a different light right you know I think lots of people do think oh you know all that they do really is they come here and they work and then they sit out on a Sunday whereas suddenly when it was like oh no actually they're also members of this incredible choir I was like okay that's that's showing these women in a whole new light. So I reached out to Jane Engelman and uh, she was happy to get involved. And then she introduced me to all the choir members and I got to know them and I started telling their stories. Um, and then because of that, the, the choir is based in a part of Hong Kong called Discovery Bay. Um, and there's another guy who works there who set up something called Helper Appreciation Month. Um, and someone had introduced me, you know, I was chatting to lots of people, someone had introduced me to him. And he was like, oh, you need to meet Lisa Avellino. And I was like, oh, yeah. And um, I went for coffee with Lisa Avellino. And I was like, yes, please be in my film. Please, can I tell your story? Um, and she graciously accepted. And the timing was really, really wonderful because um, I guess we'd started filming sort of properly September of, uh, 2015 and the following um I think it was March she was actually going uh to Nepal uh to attempt to summit um Island Peak uh which is the journey that she takes in the film so it was kind of this incredible and I was able to send a camera with her which was this incredible kind of timing thing that I was like oh my gosh you're going to realize your goal and I can kind of be there with you um so yeah, so she was great. And then um, I also knew that I, you know, I knew that I wanted to include um, uh, another nationality domestic worker because obviously there's Filipinos, but there's obviously a lot of Indonesians here in Hong Kong. Um, so I had my eyes and ears open for somebody to, that would work to tell that story. And I got to know the people at Pathfinders, um, the NGO here in Hong Kong uh, that work with migrant mothers and, and their children. And I shot a, a PSA for them, um, you know, kind of talking about what they were about. And, and, and it sort of involved a bunch of their staff members and several of their beneficiaries with ch their children came in to also appear on camera. And I think the last people that we taped that day were Narul and her little girl, Lila, who were just like a dream, you know, every director's dream. They were, they were just so lovely on camera. Um, her English is fantastic, Narul's English. And they were, you know, they were so sweet and just lovely. Uh, and when they left after the taping, I turned to someone from Pathfinders. I was like, oh, they're really lovely. What's their story? And when she told me her story, I was like, my jaw hit the floor and I was like, what? Um, and so that's why, uh, you know, then I was lucky enough that we asked Neural and she said that she would uh, let share her story with us and let us film her. And yeah, so that's how they sort of came. So I had the choir, I had Lisa and I had Neural. And then sort of within that, then the other things just started to happen. Like Anna Lynn t was telling me that she was going home for her son's graduation. And I was like, OK, great, we have to get that. And then obviously... Uh, you know, the heartbreaking situation with Vilma having to go home suddenly. Um, but again, she was kind enough and, and, and she understood enough and had the trust in me and what this project was about that she shared and, and let me into that, that, you know, that heartbreaking part of her life, which, you know, still to this day, I, I find hard to watch, even though I've obviously seen the film so many times. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was amazing how um, the women really uh, let you in uh, to so many different parts of their lives, right? When you say you, you sent a camera along with Lisa, was that, were you there or did, was somebody else with the camera? No, so, so there's kind of a funny story. Um, so we, were, we started filming in September 2015 um, and I was pregnant with my daughter and um, the clock and flap uh, the concert in the in the film at clock and flap was scheduled I think it was like November the 28th or 26th or something it was scheduled for their performance which was obviously the big finale of their story my due date was December 9th um, but on I think it was December uh, November the 24th my blood pressure shot up and so my doctor sent me to the hospital and he was like you're not leaving until you've got a baby and I was like I've got a 
finale of a film to direct <laughs> he was like <laughs> and what about your baby and I was like yeah okay fair enough so um I was fortunate enough that I had a really amazing team and we obviously had worked really tightly together at that point so I had a really specific shot list I'd really talked to everybody and then on the day I was there watching the live stream on YouTube and I had my uh, t my producers on uh, WhatsApp and basically directed via a shot list wow. five, camera, five camera men and WhatsApp yeah. and YouTube live stream and I watched in my hospital bed and it was hilarious halfway through the, the viewing the nurse came in to take my blood pressure and she was like oh my god like it's really high. What are you watching? And I explained, and she was like, I'm Filipino. And so she stayed and kind of watched the whole rest of the show with us, That's which so was sweet. amazing. So the remotely directed um, the, the Clock and Flat finale. Yeah. And so then that meant that sort of, so basically I'd, I'd kind of planned that I was going to take about January through March, April or what have you off the next year. So, <clears throat> I mean, honestly, I actually think like in full health, I don't think <clears throat> I'd be going up a mountain anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't think I'm that mountain time. Climb. So <clears throat> we trained uh, Lisa and we sent a GoPro with her. And then we were also fortunate enough that the people leading her expedition also was shooting some footage as well. And they helped us out with shooting some footage. Oh, and how about the, the shots of, you know, in Philippines when you followed Annalyn or cameras follow Annalyn? Was that you or was that? Um... Oh, so, so again, that was the same issue. I had a newborn. So I was like, I can't, I can't go like, you know, running around the yeah. Philippines uh, with a brand new baby. And I'm a, I was a first time mum as well. So I was like, ah. Um, <laughs> so no, again, like we found a really great um, production service company that we worked with in the Philippines again. And, you know, once again, I just had a really specific shot list and I knew exactly what I want I'd shared some of what we'd shot already with them and just said okay can you try and get these specific things for me and I'd already shot the interviews with Anna Lynn as well so I kind of knew where my narrative was strung out and I knew where the story or you know what she was going to be talking about so I knew kind of what I needed the visuals for. Yeah and I, I really think um, you know that scene when Vilma leaves for the airport after hearing the bad news from home I mean that was such an intimate moment and and could you tell us how how you came to be involved or your crew came to be involved in capturing that moment? I mean, I literally got a text from Vilma um, saying something's terrible, something really terrible has happened. Uh, I need to go home. Um, but if you want, you can come. Like, I, I feel like I want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, okay. So I think it was like a I can't remember if it was a Sunday. It was it was definitely, you know, like four or five o'clock in the afternoon that I got the message and she was kind of getting on like an 8 p.m. flight. So I just sent a message out to all my camera guys, who's available? And my uh, camera guy, Simon, was, and he and I um, jump hopped in a taxi and flew out to where she lived and worked and followed her for that journey. Wow. And all of this, you know, the kind of access that you have to these women's lives. I mean, it speaks to me of the great trust between you and you know the women and I'm just wondering how did you build this trust such that they were so willing to let you into these parts of their lives and to be so confessional about you know what their experience is like um, as a migrant domestic worker in Hong Kong? Um, you know to be honest I, th I think a lot of it was um, at, because I was a woman because I was a female mm -hmm. director Right. And I, and I think that they understood it. And, and I also think even actually to be said, to be honest, I think the fact that I was pregnant at the time really helped um, because people were like, you're going to get this. Like you're going to start, you're going to understand what it's like to be in my shoes in no time if you don't already. Um, mm -hmm. And so the empathy that, you know, I, I guess maybe also my line of questioning, I must have been talking to them from a place and connecting to them in a way that they felt like they could trust me and they knew that they weren't going to be misrepresented or edited or, or, or part of something that they wouldn't be proud of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's something else that was quite interesting to me that your kind of like consciousness as a director wasn't kind of like super present in the film. You know how some documentary makers, like you can kind of like, basically the story is being told by the director, but yeah. I felt that you were really invisible in it and you are letting the women take center stage and I'm just like suddenly recalling that at the back of one of the rehearsals I saw like a heavily pregnant woman and I'm wondering whether that was you yeah, that was me <laughs> a cameo <laughs> like a reflection or something like that 
<laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was, that was kind of wild. Um, you know, and, and it was crazy making my first movie while pregnant, but it was just like, oh no, you know, uh, I'm making this film. This film needs to happen. I'm, I'm going to have a child at the same time. And it actually worked really well. Um, you know, for the first few months that uh, Jemima was a baby, I was in the edit suite and she was there either, you know, being fed or changing her on the sofa next to me and she was sleeping. You know, you do, you just do what you, what you need to do as a mom and a, a filmmaker. Did you um, eventually also get, you know, a domestic helper as well? Or Yes, well, we actually had one. Um, even in in the um, in the filming of um, during the filming of the project, um, I'd initially hired uh, Janai, who came from the Philippines. Um, you know, when I was like a, a single uh, single girl, and she and her mum were actually part of the choir. So she was she's actually in the performance at wow. Clock on Flap. Cool. Um, she's not with us anymore. She actually went home back to the Philippines to uh, to do her master's uh, degree. Like she only came to us initially um, for a short term because uh, her mum worked for a friend of mine and uh, said, you know, my daughter wants to come here to earn enough to be able to save up to go do her master's degree um, and back in the Philippines. And I was like, yeah, cool. If I can, you know, empower another woman uh, to continue her education, that's amazing. Cool. And I was just wondering, I mean, you talked to us a little bit about uh, through some of the challenges that you had as a pregnant woman and then as a young mum, you know, <laughs> making a film remotely. Um, were there any other kind of challenges or fears that you had, especially since like these women were trusting you with their stories, right? So there's a huge responsibility. Uh, was, th was there any sort of... Um, anxiety around that on your on your oh, heart so much so I mean it, it was it was really really hard like the the hardest thing for me with making this film was the line between like where am I up to the point what point am I a filmmaker and what point am I their friend mm -hmm. and that was a really really tricky situation um and something that was you know was really really difficult to learn because you're supposed to I was always taught as a you know I studied broadcast journalism and I remember one of these lectures it was a media ethics lecture and it was sort of the test was that as a journalist as a as a a filmmaker you're supposed to witness and, and observe something happening and not get involved mm -hmm. right and and that's really hard especially once you know once you're very close with your subjects and you've gotten to know them you've been filming them over months and years um it's really hard to stay detached and 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 not be emotionally connected um and also sort of figure out you know how how can if you get too close how does that impact this the filmmaking and the story and and even their lives and, and my life it was it was a really hard ongoing struggle um you know I, I I maintain friendships with um most of the women you know I'm in touch with most of them um today uh and and you know, watching their journeys continue. One of the hardest things for me was to know when to when to say cut, like what point to stop filming. I mean, to be honest, we had it dictated to us financially, really, sort of when we ran out of, we were budgeted for a certain number of filming days. You know, when we ran out of that certain number of filming days, I managed to squeeze a few favours out of my crew, but we couldn't go much further. But that was also the hardest thing as well, you know, like at what point is their story done? Because obviously none of their stories really done. Yeah and I mean you were talking about that distance that a filmmaker is meant to you know maintain from their subjects. Were there any moments uh, where this like fourth wall was broken for you where you really just felt that you could not be detached from what was going on? Yeah uh, following uh, like the interview with Vilma on the bus mm -hmm. I mean both my cameraman and I were just both bawling. It was, uh, you know, it was such a hard, impossible, you know, thing to watch her going through, you know, and it was really hard to just point a camera at her and not sit there and give her a hug. Mm. You know, yeah, that I was... Like I felt that myself watching it. Yeah, I, like, I, I remember that. I remember that trip to the airport like it was yesterday. Like, I, you know, it's, it's, it's so clear in my, in my brain. And, and that's, you know, to be honest, sort of also been one of the hardest things. Um, you know, we had to maintain, you know, a really light touch around that as well because, oh, you know, the, so the film is about to screen in the Philippines for the first time. And mm -hmm. sort of identifying a minor, um, wow, you know, we yeah. had to, 
you know as, as a victim we had to be you know super duper careful a, a, around that and also that was something that you know Vilma had asked us about as well and so that was something that you know still to this day I'm like I think we did it did we do it enough um how did, did we help enough you know the, I, I think you can you know you when people are going through the situation that have become part such a big part of a film you feel like you're involved so deeply involved in their lives um and you want to help them but there's limits to what you can do obviously yeah and I and, and that like takes me to the question of um how had how did the film affect the lives of the women um you mentioned about how it was screened in the Philippines you know has it already been screened in the Philippines? no it's literally just about to be um I think the 16th or something like that we premiere in the Philippines. The Philippines uh, Film Council have invited us to be part of um, a festival. Um, uh, it's, it's obviously online this year because of COVID, but it's called, it, I can't pronounce it, it's like Pista Pin something, PPP 2020 is the name of the film festival. And yeah, we're, we're thrilled to bits that the, they've asked the helper to be part of the sort of premiere selections. Um, yeah, so, um, I, I guess in terms of how their lives have changed, well, the, the Unsung Heroes Choir um, have had loads and lovely um, publicity and exposure from the film. Um, mm -hmm. That's That's been amazing. Um, then um, Lisa Avellino, so does the Unsung Heroes, they, they sang at the Hong Kong Sevens Rugby a couple of, for the oh. last couple of years, which is awesome. They've done all kinds of like black tie galas um, wow. for, for banks and all kinds of sort of organizations and stuff like that. Like they're the headline, they've performed as the headliners at, at lots of different events, which is really lovely. You know, they're really, they're really sort of like celebrities now. Um, oh. Hong Kong which is amazing um and then Lisa Avellino just goes from strength to strength um she is now slowly transition trying to transition into a career as a motivational speaker wow yeah so is, she, is she still um employed as a uh, domestic worker she is right now yes um but she did she did a TEDx talk um I guess that was two years ago now it, that she just smashed it and now she's got a whole team she's got a career counselor uh like a pr team working with her and and you know and she just keeps uh getting invited to speak at more and more prestigious events and she's she's just doing beautifully yeah she's incredibly well spoken i mean she's such a strong public speaker and like she's a really good narrative voice you know at, like telling her story and mm -hmm. with a sense of drama as well I really enjoyed listening to her yes she, oh, she's wonderful and she's great to have a beer with as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and then um I guess the other stories oh I mean you know the, their life their lives have gone on I don't know that anyone else's life has oh Joy Carbonell um mm -hmm. she was back in the Philippines for a while she's back in Hong Kong now um she was offered uh, so this was quite interesting we actually uh, she was offered several jobs in Hong Kong um as a music teacher as a primary school teacher uh following the film which was amazing but unfortunately um we weren't able to get her the visa approved oh sadly um it seems like the immigration department um if somebody has previously come to hong kong and worked on a migrant domestic worker visa they're really reluctant or almost impossible to uh be able to see them in an in a, in a separate employment category yeah, no, I, I do have the sense that that's pretty similar to Singapore as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's very rare that, you know, a domestic worker can come back with a different type of visa. Yeah. Uh, certainly not unheard of. I recently read an article about how um, a domestic worker is now uh, working as like, a, a counsellor for a church. Like she actually got like a, you know, like the, the requisite degrees and, and certificate <laughs> and she came back. Uh, she even got like a theology degree or something. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, which is really amazing. Um, and I was also wondering, were there any of your own misconceptions about the lives of um, foreign domestic workers uh, that, that working with these women and hearing their stories debunked for you in the course of making the film? I think I really had any misconceptions because I, I guess, you know, when I arrived in Hong Kong was really the beginning of, you know, my experience of, of getting to know um, 
domestic helpers so that way you know all of that kind of knowledge as, as it came as it came along was sort of part of what went into making the film and telling these stories um you know I, I think the things that I learned were you know how highly educated so many of these women are um that was amazing to me you know sitting there with the choir and I was with accountants and teachers and you know office managers and you know really just uh, nurses like an incredible array of, of skill sets so I you know I do find it hard that that you know that they're, they're unable to use these educations that they've they've spent so much time and energy getting um you know and the, and the best possible option for them is coming here uh you know to be a domestic worker like sometimes I, I feel kind of disappointed for them in that set circumstance but then also you know um through getting to know enrich the ng the financial literacy ngo that we uh, that lisa had done the program training with in the documentary you know I have encountered these incredible stories of these women who come here, who have a financial plan, um, who save, who get on track, um, and then, you know, they return home to the Philippines on schedule, as planned, um, and they start their own businesses there and, you know, go from strength to strength. I did some, uh, some, now it's some, filming for Enrich a few months ago, telling some of their uh, beneficiaries stories for their website. These women are incredible. They were like, yep, I've got, you know, a farm, a shop, a motorcycle career or two. Um, I've also got a photocopying business, you know, and they were so dynamic and it was incredible. And I was sat there being like, oh, I don't have a farm and a house, you know, <laughs> all these things that they'd managed to do with the, you know, in what might seem a meager amount, you know, to from our perspective they've really you know done incredible things with that and and, and so I, th I think that's it right you know it's not putting our own preconceptions on someone else um you know can also enable us to be quite surprised in wonderful ways yeah and I think um well growing up from like a culture where there always has been you know domestic workers I think that's when you know we would have a lot of preconceptions about right domestic. sure yeah, um, which have to be debunked by, you know, knowing them as people, right? And um, so my helper, um, uh, Sophia, I mean, she's been with our family for 20 years. She's very much part of our family. Um, and I guess I grew up listening to her stories. Um, and yeah, and, and, and I also, you know, she also has a similar story of how she's like provided for like her family and extended family, owns multiple properties, very enterprising, you know, and, every time there's some sort of natural disaster, like she, or like typhoon, you know, she's always there, like, she sends money back and she helps her entire village, like literally her entire village. So I feel that, you know, this kind of like generosity and, and like strength of spirit and character is something that we, um, you know, might not um, fully appreciate because I've worked with domestic workers in Singapore um, as a writer and uh, brought them into... Um, uh, like writing workshops and I've asked them, uh, oh, you know, let's, let's write a piece about what is one question that you would want like a Singaporean to ask you. And I remember one of the women, she just said, um, how are you today? Like that was the question that she wished she were asked. Yeah. And, and to me, um, it was just incredibly heartbreaking because, uh, you know, these women are really so, so, involved in all the intimate moments of our lives right you know you think of like being a baby and having your nappy changed right all the way till you know caregiving and at, at someone's at the end of someone's life right they're part of the entire care cycle um and yet we you, you know sometimes people do not see the humanity in them um and i think your film just brings it out in, in such a beautiful way and in a much needed way. So I really do hope that it finds uh, many more um, audience, uh, you know, members in Singapore who would like engage with the film. I understand that there are a whole bunch of ways that you can watch the film um, on the website, listed on the website. I personally rented it on Vivo and I thought that was like really easy, really fuss free. Um, yeah, and I guess one of the other observations I had was that based on your film at least, it seemed as if there were so many different ways for, uh, uh, for migrant domestic workers to be integrated into Hong Kong society, 
and I, I'm not sure whether it was like a kind of skewed uh, sample that you were showing us, but you know, I, I saw like, well, there's the choir, uh, the hiking club, um, and I also know about Splash Foundation, which uh -huh. you know, runs like, um, swimming classes for. They're for amazing, them. yes. Yeah, because uh, one of the friends that I, I made um, through the writing classes, she learned how to swim through Splash, and now she does like open water marathons. Uh, and, aquathons or whatever they're called when they're in the water um and i and i was just wondering like do you think is is this really what it's like in hong kong or like it's like is this representative of of like a domestic workers uh, what's available to domestic workers in hong kong yeah i i do i, I think it is um you know, I I think there's a, there's a lot more options than just you know sitting out on the pavement on a Sunday. Um, Lisa Avellino uh, is now I see her. She's set up two dragon boat racing teams. Um, wow, you know, that's incredible. Amazing. She's all, she's also now part of. Uh, she's also playing cricket. Um, you know, so that's another option. Uh, I know that there's loads of various different hiking and hiking trail running you know all kinds of different programs and things like that um some of the uh fitness organizations here offer free yoga um free workouts and and things like that so i feel like there is a lot i don't think it's necessary i think maybe you have to track it down via word of mouth there's there's also a great organization at hong kong university called empower you and they have a whole range of programs um that domestic workers can go and do that are taught by um hku faculty and students um on a wow. sunday and they can get certifications from that um yeah like there's 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 more and more and more and more organizations and initiatives sort of being set up and coming together which is amazing to see and I guess another observation I had was that a lot of the women that you featured happen to have expat employers. And at least in right. Singapore, you have that, this stereotype that uh, usually like expat employers um, are, you know, they, they would encourage uh, uh, the women um, who work for them to like pursue their individual passions more so than those with local employers who might not, who might be a little bit more circumspect about such opportunities. Was this something that you observe in Hong Kong society or, um, yeah? <laughs> no, not really. I mean, you know, yes, it, it did happen that the majority of our protagonists in the film uh, did have more expat employers, but there were other members of the choir. I don't know if you can see Narcissa on the, on the uh, poster behind me. Oh, um, yeah. Another of the choir members, her employers were local. They were a, a lovely elderly couple. Um, I think it was just that the stories that we chose to follow, the women who have the stories that we chose to follow most intensely happened to have um, expat employers, but it, it kind of, it wasn't something that we went after because, you know, in within the choir, there was a complete diverse range of different nationalities of employers. So, and everyone was involved in the choir and in sort of the same way. So yeah, I, d I don't think it is that. Um, I think sort of the opportunities are there across the board. And I understand we have five more minutes. So okay. I really want to ask about, you know, the response to the film in Hong Kong and the kind of conversations that the film has started and your own um, advocacy work that has gone on after the film or perhaps like the advocacy work that has, that the film has inspired. Like what has that looked like? Um, well, the, the the reaction to the film was absolutely mind blowing. We managed to persuade uh, Edco Films, who own AMC Cinemas and Movie Movie Cinemas here in Hong Kong, to give us a theatrical release. And I think initially they gave us five days, and we were like, okay, we will try to not be embarrassing. We'll try to sell the tickets. Like we'll really do our best. And the tickets sold out in like five minutes, and it was amazing. Wow. And then we kept on selling out and kept on selling out, and they kept giving us more screenings. And we ended up in the cinema for three about three months. Um, and the wonderful thing that started happening was that um, employers were buying groups of tickets, um, either going with their helpers, like with their friends and all the helpers together, or they were buying blocks of tickets and giving them as a gift to their helpers, along with, you know, money for popcorn and stuff like that. And it became this really kind of like communal 
um word of mouth but like a communal viewing experience like it was it was really lovely like in the cinemas watching it I, I went and then another friend told me that there were people like shouting at the screen you know like when one time when Lisa was getting to the top of the mountain someone was like you go girl <laughs> um, and so like that was incredible and was just the most amazing surprise and then because of that success we were able to go on to this international distribution so uh you know that's been incredible and, and from getting it on things like Cathay Pacific, we had lawyers phoning us, uh, volunteering pro bono support, taking on the whole Pathfinders caseload. We got a free scholarship for um, the little girl in the film, Lila, at an amazing preschool. All these incredible things just happened. And then we started doing corporate and school screenings and they were amazing as well and sort of, uh, you know, also took us to a whole new audience who maybe wouldn't have been people who would have chosen initially to go see a film about domestic workers in the cinema. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's been amazing, like the, the reach of the film. Um, and I got so inspired by it that uh, I, I did a screening um, a couple of years ago and I was on a panel with a, a group of women who were also artists who were Filipino domestic helpers. Um, and we came up with the idea collectively of doing a children's book together. So we've actually written a children's book now called My Extra Special Auntie okay. because the film has reached, has did so well and reached such a broad audience, but it just wasn't quite appropriate for, you know, maybe children under the age of 11. Um, and I really wanted them to know, you know, they're the ones who are in the closest contact with the, with their aunties. And I really wanted them to realize, you know, auntie is here as a, as a paid professional. She's got a life and dreams and ambitions back home and often a family back home. Um, and so we've told that story The artists have done the illustrations and I've written the book and it's in English and Chinese. And uh, yeah, we're moving towards getting that published now to sort of continue um, empowering these women and, and putting them in the spotlight. Amazing. Thank you so much. I think this conversation has really shown us like the power of socially conscious filmmaking, that it really just inspires action and it creates a grassroots movement. I mean, it started with a grassroots mo movement with your Kickstarter campaign, but yeah. then I think it just generates even more energy. Um, and, and thank you so much for putting this film into the world because you really put um, the stories of these women out there and you know, stories always just change people's minds and hearts. And um, I'm, I'm really excited about more people watching your film. So uh, everyone who's watching this, uh, you can uh, find out how to watch the Helper documentary at helperdocumentary.com. And the soundtrack is also available on Spotify. I'm highlighting that because I loved the choral performance pieces from the Unsung Heroes. I just like kept looping it. It, it was just amazing. So thank uh -huh. you so much. Joanna for your time and thank you for having us to be part of the festival okay bye bye enjoyed talking to you thank you I'm Nurul Hidayah I'm from Indonesia I have been in Hong Kong like seven years working my family is uh, quite big three brother and um, two sister I'm looking for money for my family. So many my relatives, my neighbor, they come to Hong Kong, they can build a house, they can have an easily life. The first employer I have, I just stay there like uh, one year. I'm look after the kids like uh, two years. Then they said I cannot cooking. I have to try and try. But they cannot, they cannot wait for that, so they just terminate me. My second employer is uh, from Germany, and the uh, Indonesian, the woman is from Indonesia. I'm looking for two kids. One is was uh, only two weeks when I come there, and the second one was uh, three years or three years or two years, something like that. Then I stay there like uh, 22 months, almost finish a contract. Then I was just having a case with them. They called the police to come to my place. They arrest me because they said I'm stealing something from them.
So I living there in my friend place until I get this baby with my boyfriends. Once a domestic migrant worker becomes pregnant, all too often um, she is fired from her employment and because domestic workers are required to live in the employer's home, what then happens is that her whole security net breaks. They bring me to the police station because my employer is look like I don't want you anymore, you know. After 30 minutes having an interrogate in a police station, then I go to agency place. They're not even asking me to extend my visa. Within two weeks of the end of her employment, she's denied all access to social um, and public health and welfare protection. More often than not, a loan shark, the agency, or indeed sometimes the employer, will be holding on to her identity papers. She literally and physically is unable to leave Hong Kong. So, as for anyone who's in a desperate situation, the, the falling into the worst levels of precarity happens very quickly. That I'm already pregnant eight, eight months. Before the last cut, I go to consulate. After consulate, they give me a travel document. Maybe after finish this court, maybe I go back to Indonesia. That's what I wish to always. Then I go to immigration. The immigration tell me that I already overstay over one year. So I'm asking them to give back my ID, my passport, please just give back because I have this kind of case that they don't want to accept. It's not finding guilty. It was wasting very long time for me. If I'm working, maybe I already can build a house. It was evident from the start that Lisa was uh, an active person in, in mind and body. I mean, you know, she, um, she was wanting to do things that I guess a lot of helpers don't do. The first travel that I'd done was um, I went to Kanchanaburi in Thailand. My boss gave me the plane ticket. That, that, that brings out the adventurist in me, like very strong personality that I didn't realize before. From then on, I look for places where easy visa for a Filipino passport holder in Southeast Asia. So I did Indonesia, Vietnam, and then I realized I wanted to go higher. I've always been attracted by the Himalayas. If you go to Himalayas, you have to walk on snow. But before going to Himalayas to spend so much money, you need to experience the snow and then end up in Japan. I applied for a visa. They gave me a hard time. She had to go to the Japanese embassy, embassy goodness knows how many times, because they just had never issued a visa to um, a Filipino helper before. Mm -hmm. After two weeks, they called me. Lisa, come over to the office. And then when I went to the consulate, they had me a passport with a single entry. Ah, ecstatic, I cried. <laughs> I just followed the, the Japanese climbers. They're so used to walking on snow, so they're fast. I'm supposed to walk it like 12 hours, and it becomes 15 hours. And then I made it up. For me, it's not good enough. I said, I want to go higher. I told my boss, I'm going to Nepal. I said, I'm going to Everest Base Camp. Thank you.